All three projects are totaling 20 million. And I just got great news today. We just crossed the 9 million mark for total, uh, you know, total dollars that have come in just in the last two years. So people are coming excited to see what God's going to do because it is, it is going to take God. I mean, that, that's ambitious to do within a two to three year period of time. But his kingdom come, his will be done, right? Yep. This isn't just we're willing it to happen. He's bringing people to the table. We all have a responsibility in the skills and talents that we have to nurture that next generation. It's a good stewardship is really time, talent, and treasure. Yeah. And I think it, we, we all need to take a deep look at ourselves to see how God would be using each one of those, how we do spend our money. And we feel that this is a very good investment. What picture do we paint for people on why Kingdom Builders, why you chose to go all in? You know, the, we, we go back, we ask people who used to be very active in the church, and then they just drop off. And it's like, oh, well, when my kids were young, we went to Sunday school every Sunday, and it just stopped there. And so when the kids graduated or they moved on, then they, their activity in the church also started to wane. Mm -hmm. And um, the thing with, with Kingdom Builders and the school is I really believe we can prevent that from happening. When, if you go to Sholo and see these girls that come out of the program, and you see the joy in their face and you understand their past. They were on meth or they were on the street or they, I don't know where they came from. And they look sad. And when they come out of the program, they're so excited. They're excited to get a job. They're excited to take care of their children. They're excited about everything. Life is good. God is in them. There's no question. The Holy Spirit gave me this phrase. We see people, not buildings. It's because we're bringing people in. It's a place of refuge. Right. So when, when I say we see people, not buildings, what, what comes up for you? We see people. We see ways we can meet the need. As they say, find a need and meet it. My vision is, is that God keeps putting needs on our hearts and our church and given the church opportunities. And so we have a responsibility mm -hmm. to meet those needs. And God's going to help us to do that. And we need to do that through kingdom builders, through people, et cetera, et cetera. You know, obviously God provided Scottsdale and Glendale, and now it's expanded to California and Oklahoma. And to see the vision of where Pastor Luke wants to take us with churches really on every corner of the state, from Yuma to Kingman to Flagstaff, uh, Tucson, uh, what does that do for you as, as people a part of this church family when you hear that kind of vision? It's exciting. It's what we're all about, isn't it? Really, of being able to spread the, 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 the word of God. Um, I just find it incredibly, it's, it's, it's a, I think maybe one of you said it earlier, you know, it's, it's a train I want to be on because it's going somewhere, you know, it's exciting. I love being involved in innovation. I was invested in uh, startups for 30 years in Silicon Valley. So I love getting involved in new projects and seeing. So our church is continuing to do that all the time. So it's ready, aim, fire kind of thing. You know, you just go and do it and learn from it and then just keep don't let it stop you from progress. And that's really what we're all about. The side of the coin is if, it, if God gives you a calling, he provides resources. Mm -hmm. I've heard, seen that several times in, in my own life. That's it. You know, I'm from the South, so there's a lot of quippy things that preachers say. Uh, but I, I've always heard there's provision for the co-mission. Oh, okay. Right? Um, and that co-mission is meant to be with God and mm -hmm. doing his work because as we all know, his gospel is not going to be stopped. It won't be. We get to be the church that is, is kingdom bringers, right? Uh, as Matthew 6 uh, states so well. An Englishman moved here to America from the old country. And he worked hard and he made some deals and he was able to earn a million dollar check and he took it to a bank and said, I'd like to deposit this million dollars in your bank. The man said, wonderful, would you sign here and sign there and sign here? And the Englishman said, wait, 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 this is not how we do things in, in, our, in the old country. Uh, I'm taking my business elsewhere. I don't have to sign all these forms. So he walks out across the street to a, another bank and he walks in and the banker happened to be from the old country as well. And so they began to talk and he said, I'd like to 
uh, deposit my million dollars in your bank. And the guy, the old guy from the old country said, well, you got to sign here and sign there and sign over here. Well, this guy got mad again. He said, I don't want to jump through all those hoops. Well, just then the banker from the old company reached across the table, grabbed him by the hair of his head and began to beat his head against the table like this. A few weeks later, the man was walking down the road. He saw the original banker and he said, hey, did, were you able to deposit that money? And he said, yeah, right across the street. He said, why did you deposit it with them and not us? And he said, because that guy had a way of explaining it better to me than you did. <laughs> well, today I wanna to explain to you the best way I can why it is that God wants to bless your life why he wants to bless my life, why he wants to bless this church. And look, everybody wants to be blessed. Can you say amen to that? I want my blessing of a new car. I want my blessing of a new house. I want my blessing of a new career. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, you can't read the Bible without talking about the blessings of God and how God really wants to bless his children. But what we don't often hear is God's side of the blessing. And that's what I wanna to talk to you about today. Why would God want to bless us? There's a great story in Luke chapter five that explains why God wants to bless us. This scene takes place at the Sea of Galilee. Everybody say Galilee. Galilee. I wanna make sure you're awake today. And on this particular morning, Jesus is teaching on the beach and there's so many people gathering while he's teaching that now he's backing up and his heels are against the water's edge. They're crowding him into the lake, into the sea. Now, that never happens to me. The longer I teach, the more the crowd tends to thin out. How many know what I'm talking about? Don't say amen. Okay. But this is a problem for Jesus. And so Jesus, in verse 2, this is what it says. He saw the water's uh, edge, at the water's edge, two boats left there by two fishermen, or by the fishermen, who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, this is Peter, and asked him to put out a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he finished speaking, so understand, the sermon's over. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, Peter, put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. So Jesus finishes his general sermon to the masses. And then he turns to Peter and he says, put out your boat into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Notice, Jesus starts with a sermon to the multitudes. But now he's gone from a sermon to everybody to an instruction to somebody. He's gone from a message to the masses to a message to a man, a revelation that only one man hears. Peter is listening. Look, it's one thing for you to come to church today and hear a message for everybody. It's an entirely different thing when you hear a message with your name on it. Come on, somebody. A message to you personally. It takes me 15 hours of work to prepare a sermon for the masses every Sunday morning. It's very frustrating and really depressing to me to know that 95% of what I preach in the next 35 minutes will be forgotten by Monday morning. I can't think about it too long. I'll get depressed and want to quit the ministry. But that's true. I come here. I, I prepare 15 hours. I give a 35-minute message. You nod at me. You smile at me. You amen me because you want to encourage your pastor. But the truth is, you will forget 95% of what I say by Monday morning. But let me tell you the sermon you will never forget. It's the one that has your name on it. Come on, somebody. It's a difference between a person who says after service, great sermon, pastor, and the person who says, that was for me. That had my name on it. So look, when you come to church, don't come to church just to hear the word of God. Come to church to get a word from God so that you know that God is speaking to you personally in your life. So Jesus says, Peter, I just gave a message to the masses but now I got a word for you. Put your boat out into the deep and let down your nets for a great catch. 
Notice how specific Jesus' word is for Peter. He tells him where to go into the deep, what to do, let down your net, and what to expect, a great catch, a great windfall. He gives a very specific message with Peter's name on it. He was calling Peter by name. Well, Peter answers Jesus in verse five. Master, we have worked hard fishing all night long, and we have caught nothing. Now, I hear attitude in Peter's words here. Do you hear it? Like, master, just in case you don't know, let me explain to you something. We have been working all night long, like Lionel Richie's song, all night long, come on, somebody, and we have caught nothing. Let me tell you Peter's problem. Peter is a partner in the Zebedee Fishing Corporation. That's what verse 10 says. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. So this is a very successful fishing business with partners. They are the pros. They are the professionals. Jesus is not a fisherman. He's a carpenter. He spent 30 years of his life with his dad in a carpentry shop making tables and chairs. That's what he did up until he was 30 years old. So now we have a carpenter trying to give a professional fisherman advice on how to fish. So Peter, he's going to set Jesus straight. Jesus, I don't go into your wood shop and tell you how to do carpentry. So let me explain to you how the pros fish on Galilee. First of all, on Galilee, you fish at night, not during the daytime. And it's daytime right now. Furthermore, you don't fish in in deep waters on Galilee. You use nets. And you go where the fish go, and they go to shallow waters where it's warmer. So Jesus, bless your heart, Jesus, you got it almost exactly backwards. It's not how it's done on Galilee. Jesus is giving Peter fishing instructions that contradict his years of experience and expertise as a professional fisherman. Peter pushes back, Master, I know where to fish, I know how to fish, I know where they're located, and we have fished all night long and we've caught nothing. This whole thing has been a bust. They're not biting, Jesus. Quick time out. There are two ways you can tell that a big blessing is on your horizon. I'm not talking about a small little blessing like the fact that you can breathe air right now. You know, we we take those things for granted until we can't breathe. And then all of a sudden we're like, God, please bless me with air. But how do you know that God is getting ready to bless you with big stuff, a big blessing, out of the ordinary, special favor? Here it is, listen carefully. You know you're getting ready for a big blessing from God when God allows all your human efforts to be unsuccessful. That's what Peter said. Master, we have fished all night long and caught nothing. We have worked where you're supposed to work, when you're supposed to work, how you're supposed to work, and for all of our efforts, we have empty nets. It's when you go job hunting and nobody returns the call. It's when you poured your life into something for years and years and years and nothing is happening. It's when you've worked hard all night long and you've caught nothing and you feel awful. Listen, you may feel awful, but I'd like to suggest to you it may not be a real bad spot to be in because God's getting you ready for something big. Secondly, You know you're getting ready for a colossal blessing when God asks you to do something that doesn't make any sense. Jesus said, Peter, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. What did Peter say? (laughs) Jesus, God, that's backwards. I know fishing. And I know that you don't go fishing for a huge catch on Galilee at daytime. And you certainly don't go into the deep to make a big catch. What Jesus is asking Peter to do contradicts his knowledge, his expertise, and his instincts. So Peter needs to teach Jesus a lesson on why his word won't work. He gave him a word, right? Master, I know what you're telling me to do. 
But we've been fishing all night long, the way you're supposed to do it, we're the pros, and they are not biting. Have you ever done that? Liar, liar, pants on fire. Sure you have. Now, we do it real respectful like, like Peter did. Master, master of teaching, master of preaching, master of the winds, master of the waves, master of a lot of things other than fishing. Hello. I'm going to respect you and call you Lord and call you master because clearly you are the master of many things. But what you're not master of is my area of life. What you're not master of is what I'm going through right now. It happens all the time. God says something through his word. I want you to do this. This is my command. Be obedient. But my reality, we say, my experience, my instincts are telling me to do something different. Can I tell you something about your instincts and my instincts? They're distorted. They're flawed. It's like going into a 3D movie. If you don't have those glasses on, you're not seeing all there is to be seen because your vision is distorted. All of us have developed instincts in this life based on our background, our child rearing, our life experiences, and those instincts are very real, but they're also very distorted. They're distorted because of sin, our own sin, and the sin of other people. They're distorted for a lack of information. How many times have you said, no, this is the way things are, until you got a little more information, and you were like, oh, and you changed your mind. Because now you have more information that's been injected into uh, the equation. Now, don't ignore your instincts, but understand that your instincts are flawed. Now, look, it is so comical to read this story 2,000 years later. Because Peter's instincts, his experience, and his expertise are, are contradicting the son of the living God. He's telling the son of the living God that he's wrong. Jesus, you don't know this field like I know this field. So Jesus, you ought to stick to preaching. You ought to stick to teaching, Jesus. You ought to stick to, you know, healing people and taking care of the church and stuff like this. But but you just don't know my business. You don't know my fishing business. Well, then Peter says this in verse five. I love this. What a great story. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Now, That sounds spiritual, but I think this is what he was saying. Master, just to prove to you that I know what I'm talking about, I'm going to go ahead and let down the nets. Watch this, verse 6. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. Gang, do you know how many fish it takes to break a commercial fisherman's net? 153, good answer. I'm not sure if that's right, but uh, a lot more than that, brother. Amen. These nets are made for this kind of thing, and they broke. In other words, what they naturally had to contain the blessing was not enough. Come on, somebody. So verse 7, verse 7. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. So this is a big company. They got other boats in this company on the lake. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. Are you following me? We got nets breaking and boats sinking. That's what I call a massive blessing. If the apostle Paul were preaching, he'd say it like this. He's able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all you can ever ask or think or even imagine. Jesus blew their mind. But they only got their minds blown when they did something contrary to their past experience and their instincts that seemed absolutely ridiculous. Are you following me this morning? Three quick reasons why God wants to bless your life and my life. And I believe this, you go to some churches, well, let's just be real humble. God doesn't want to bless us. We should be, you know, just walking around all sad. No, you can't read the Bible without seeing the blessings of God and how he wants to bless his people. Here's the first reason why God wants to bless you. He wants to bless you to let you know that he knows more than you know. Oh, I just wish that I was preaching in a black church right now because they'd be shouting me down because they really believe this stuff. 
Here's what, uh, I got some black brothers and sisters here. You need to recruit more black brothers and sisters, you know, to, to help the pastor preach. All right. Here's, here's what we think. We think that, we think that God either doesn't know or maybe he knows a little bit more than we know. And the way I know that we think this way is because we will always try to counteract what God says in his word with, yeah, but. Well, I think it's this way. I think it's that way. Jesus asked Peter to do something contrary to his instincts to prove to him, I know where the fish are and I know how to get them. And you would have never, never even thought about how to get them because your instincts tell you to fish at night in shallow water. But my knowledge says that those babies are out there right now in the daylight, in the shallow water, I mean, in, in the deep water rather, and they're just waiting to snuggle up in your nets. But until you do what I ask you to do, you will not experience the greatest catch, the greatest blessing, the greatest windfall of your life. Having a prayer meeting is not gonna get you the blessing. Prayer is very important, but it cannot replace obedience to God. You must do what God asks you to do. God wants you to know that he knows. And in order to show you that he knows he will put you in a situation in life, and some of you are there right now, where your knowledge and your instincts will not work. And he will ask you to do something that contradicts all of your natural reasoning so that when you trust him and he comes through for you, you now he has now made himself more trustworthy to you so you can start trusting him in other areas of your life. Listen, Jesus knew more about fishing than Peter did. And when Peter trusted him, he received his breakthrough. God is looking for people who will trust him, not just in fishing, not just in finances, but with their parenting, with their spouse, the way they manage their business, the way they speak. He's looking for people who will trust him because God's got you. God, God has a better way of life for you. Like a man one day who fell over a cliff, he was hiking and he slipped and fell. And as he fell over a cliff, 2,000 feet down, he reached up and grabbed a little branch and he's hanging over the cliff and he begins to cry out, is anybody up there? Is anybody up there? Help me. All of a sudden a voice cried out from nowhere. I'm here, my son. I'm here to help you. Do you believe I can help you? Yes, I believe you can help me. Do you believe I want to help you? Yes, I believe you want to help me. Then let go. The man said, is there anybody else up there? <laughs> Sometimes when it seems like God is requesting the ridiculous because it goes against all of our instincts, all of our, our history, our, our experience. He is setting you up for something supernatural and that's why he's not letting you catch anything. That's why nothing is working. He wants you to know that he knows more than you and he wants you to trust him. Second reason why God wants to bless you is to let you know how different he is than you are. Now follow me here, verse eight. When, it says, when Simon Peter saw this, what is this? Nets breaking and boats sinking. When he saw this, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. What made Peter say, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Verse nine tells us, for he and his companions were astonished at the catch of the fish. That, that had come in, uh, what astonished them? The blessing, the blessing, the size of the catch was so massive that it blew their minds. It overwhelmed them with astonishment and they realized in that moment whose presence they were in. And they said, Peter said, go away from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. Friends, look at me. God wants you and me to understand how awesome he is how holy he is, how pure he is, how amazing he is by your blessing. Okay, now most of us look at our blessing as confirmation about how awesome we are. Look at what I've done, look at, look, look at my blessing, you know? 
I must be really good for God to bless me like this. But that's not what Peter said. Peter said, he must be really good to bless a mess like me. I see whose presence I'm standing in right now. He is God. I'm not. I'm a sinful man. Well, well, wait a minute, Luke. I don't see any great sin that Peter committed. Oh, Peter sinned here. What was his sin? His sin was telling God, you don't know what you're talking about. We have fished all night long and caught nothing. Look, when you tell God, when you hear a sermon and tell God, I ain't doing that, I know more than you, that's not like a compliment, friends, right? You don't know what you're talking about in my marriage. You don't know what you're talking about in my family. You don't know what you're talking about in my body. You don't know what you're talking about in my finances. But I'm going to just placate you. I'm going to come to church. I'm going to call you Lord. I'm going to get in the boat and row out there to show you that I know more than you. Verse 9, and he was astonished. Why was he astonished? He didn't think anything was going to (laughs) happen. At least not nets breaking and boat sinking. God really does want us to know how different he is than us. In fact, in the Bible, whenever people who had a heart for God got in his presence, they'd say things like this, woe unto me, for I am undone. They would say, my righteousness before you is as filthy rags. So look, when God manifests his goodness to you, I'm talking about stream blessing now. It is not to show you and me how great we are. It's to show us how different we are than he is. That it's a sin to even question his word. When it doesn't line up with our own intuition or experience or knowledge. Peter was so amazed by the blessing that he said, depart from me. I'm not worthy to be in the same vicinity of you because now I know who I'm dealing with. I'm not just dealing with a nicey, 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 polite little God here. Some people came to church today with some bad teaching that said God's just a polite little nice God, a dainty little deity that fits into our mold. God wants us to understand that we are not even in his ballpark. He says, my ways are not your ways. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. As high are the heavens above. That's how different my thoughts are than your thoughts. And I'm going to show it to you how different we are by blessing you. Wow. Let's finish the story here today. Verse 9. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. Verse 10. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon... Catch us now. Don't be afraid. From now on, you will fish for people. Oh, I hope you get this. So they pulled their boats up on the shore and they left everything and they followed him. Why did Jesus say, don't be afraid? Because they realized whose presence they were in. They were in the presence of almighty God. They said, who is this man? Again, friends, we have to understand. Let's not get just so... So used to, used to God that we don't honor him for who he really is. We're not just dealing with a great man. In fact, to call Jesus a great man is to insult him because he's more than just a great man. He's more than just a great teacher. He's more than just a great preacher. He's more than just a great healer. He is the son of the living God and there needs to be that distinction in our lives. Peter fell down at Jesus' feet and said, go away from me, Lord. I don't even deserve to be in this space with you. Jesus calmed their fear and said, don't be afraid. From now on, you're going to fish for people. You're going to be fishers of men. Why does God want to bless you? He wants to bless you to show you that he knows more than you. He wants to bless you to show you how different you are than he is. And number three, he wants to bless you so that you can be a blessing to somebody else. Jesus told them, I'm going to make you a spiritual blessing to others. I'm going to make you fishers of men. 
This word blessing, let me define it for you. The word blessing means enjoying, experiencing, and transferring the goodness of God in your life. If there is no transfer of the blessings of God, then guess what? We have prostituted the term blessing. And that's the problem with the emphasis on blessing today. Many people only define it in terms of what will I get? You know, God blessed me with a house and blessed me with a car and blessed me with money and all these things. Nothing wrong with the blessings of God. But God's blessings are always designed to have a transfer element to them. And if there is no transfer element to the blessings of God in our life, we have prostituted the blessing. God told Abraham, I'm going to bless you, and through you, all the nations of the world will be blessed. So look, while we're praying to God for a blessing, and by the way, that's a legitimate prayer. We should pray for God's blessing in our life. But while we're praying for God's blessing, let's also add on, and when you bless me, here's how I'm going to be a blessing to your kingdom and to other people. Jesus said in verse 10, From now on, you will fish for people. That's what he's saying to you. Fishers of men. This is so cool. Peter says, Jesus says, rather, Peter, I'm I'm gonna use your occupation. You're good at catching stuff. You're good at catching fish. I'm gonna use your natural occupation to allow you to catch people. He uses his regular occupation Vocation as an opportunity for ministry. Look at verse 11. So they pulled their boats up on shore and they left everything and they followed him. I'm almost done. Don't miss this final point. I was studying and praying this week and thinking about how it must have been for Peter and his brothers to receive this massive windfall of fish. It's the windfall of their lifetime. They received this, yet they walked away from it. I'm just trying to be honest. I'm not sure I would have rolled that way. If I had nets breaking and boats sinking because Jesus knows exactly where all the fish are, I think that I may have offered Jesus a partnership in the fishing business. (laughs) Jesus, just tell me, what percentage in the company do you want? What, what percentage of partnership in the Zebedee Fishing Corporation do you want? And Jesus, you don't even have to work hard. All you got to do is show up in the morning and just point. Just point to where the fish are, Jay, man. That's all you got to do to be partner. I know you told me to follow you, but I want to make you an offer, Jesus. Why don't you follow me? And we can do something together. I could use somebody like you. I could use you to build my company. I could use you to build my wardrobe. I could use you to build my transportation. Come on, somebody. I could use you to build my retirement. That's what's going on today in the name of blessing. People wanting to use God to help their nets break and their boat sink. But Jesus flips the script. He says, I blessed you so much so that you could follow me, not so that I would follow you. That's why I blessed you. I mean, if I were there and I got the windfall, I think I'd be discussing with Jesus my new condo on the Sea of Galilee. It's time for me to build a second home, Jesus in Galilee. Now that I got you on my agenda, let's start talking about 401s and 4013Bs and investments and all these new opportunities that are there for me because I've had the single biggest windfall of my life. But verse 11 says that they were not so impressed with the blessing, they were more impressed with the blesser. And they were so impressed that when Jesus said, follow me, they said, let's go. Let's walk away. And they left everything. Can I ask you a question today? Has God's blessing caused you to follow him more deeply? Or are you spending all your time counting your fish? And you've forgotten the one who showed you where all the fish were located. Final question. Well, look, what about all those fish? We're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars equivalent in our day. They were going to live for years off this catch. It was amazing. That's always bothered me. Because 
it's the biggest catch of their lives, and they walked away from everything to follow Jesus. Did, did Jesus just give them the greatest catch of their life, only to have them just throw the fish away? Well, the Bible says that Peter is married. He had a wife and children. The Bible also says that he took care of his mother-in-law in his own house, so he was a really good man. Come on, somebody. So Peter's question when Jesus said, come follow me, was, how am I going to take care of my family? How am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to make the house payments and also follow Jesus? Well, the way fishermen made their money was they caught the fish, took it to the market, and they were handed money in exchange for the fish. The Bible also tells us that Jesus and his disciples carried around a bag of money to support the ministry. So, would you allow me to use some sanctified imagination here this morning? The reason why maybe they had such a big bag of money was because of the hoisting of this windfall of fish. It was a massive blessing because God was getting them ready for a massive ministry. It was the launch of the church on planet Earth. So he blessed them so he could pay the bills for his family, take care of his family, but also fulfill their calling. So look, God is not saying, follow me and don't pay your bills. He's not saying, follow me and don't take care of your family and their future. He's not saying, follow me and don't, don't enjoy my blessings. He's saying the reason I'm going to bless your life is so that you can follow me. It's so that you can have more time to prayer and learn the power of prayer in the human life. It's so you can have more time to read my word. Come on, somebody. It's so you can take the blessing and transfer it into the kingdom of God. So that your life doesn't just consist of, consist of dealing for dollars but you become a fisher of men and you begin to deal for destinies and your life has purpose and significance and meaning. That's why God wants to bless you and me to let us know that he knows a lot more than we know and we can trust him. Number two, to show us how different he is than we are. And then last, to make us a blessing, to use our lives in a way that they can never be used in this earth's economy system. So we're gonna finish by hearing one final testimony. It will be done in just five minutes. I'm gonna ask my wife, Angel, to come forward right now. And um, the last service in Scottsdale, she just jumped up on the stage. I would have loved to have seen that right here, okay. Angel has to hear my sermon on Saturday night and then twice on Sunday. So last night when I was preaching it to her, she reminded me of something that happened to me back when I was just 24 years of, old, of age. Just to give you an overview of who my dad was, he passed away at 69 years old, but he started out as a teacher. And while the other teachers were enjoying their weekends, he would fly down to California, buy a beat up car, drive it back in the middle of the night while everyone else was sleeping. He would borrow an auto body shop and he would fix the body and paint it. And the teachers didn't understand why he on his salary was driving a new car every weekend. With that money, he bought a huge uh, English Tudor mansion, flipped it, remodeled it, with that money, he bought a mobile home park, managed it. With that money, he got a loan and started building apartments. He then came to Phoenix, Arizona, and hit the boom within the building apartments. But it was the stack of, of bills that I saw go out every month to widows and pastors, and building schools in Haiti, all that hard work and grit because it was the stack that he was able to pour out into the world. That's why he worked so hard. But the privilege and perspective that I had to live in a businessman's home and then to be able to live in a minister's home, to start to see the vision behind the why, the gifts. What a privilege that was for me. And when Luke was an evangelist at the beginning, he would go out and speak, but it was for a love offering. 
Sometimes the offerings felt like love and sometimes they weren't so loving. So you never really had predictability on how to build a budget. And, and so Luke thought, well, if, if Ed did it, maybe I could flip a few houses on the side. And my dad got wind and word of that and said, no, stay to your calling. I am here to support you and we're to work together. So stay the course, do what you're called to do. And as, as my dad was able to partner with ministers, I was able to see him be able to give a million dollars to the LA Dream Center when they were about ready to close the doors. My brother, following his lead, gave a second million. And it, it's, it's, it's the why. It's just, it's just green stuff without the transfer, not into a Swiss bank, but into heaven of souls. That was the reason why. And the time is the other thing. From this perspective that I'm seeing now, the exponential giving my dad was able to do while he was alive and died really young, but accomplished. He had planned for the future. Sometimes the infrastructure that our world sets up to tell you you're gonna be safe for your future, it fails, it can fail you. So I would throw out a challenge today. Let's live and give when we know where it's going. Because I believe our time is short and the world is really fighting for our children. How hard are we willing to fight for our kids and get these next gen buildings built? So it's so exciting to see the lives transformed in the dream centers that all of you have been able to put on their feet. And we thank you for that. But there's so much more for the businessmen and women. What if, if you would catch that vision of net breaking income, but God isn't doing it for you. He's doing it because he know that your true joy is gonna come and seeing the lives changed. Amen. Good word, Angel, thank you. And if you know the Unicum family, they really enjoyed life. They enjoyed the blessings of God as well because when you're a good steward, God allows you to enjoy all the blessings along with being a blesser. So I'm gonna ask you to stand to your feet all across this place without losing focus. Please, nobody leave, we're almost done. But you really need to hear this final challenge. Next weekend is our Kingdom Builders Commitment Sunday. We're asking every person here at Dream City Church to make a nine month commitment to help us build the new children's facility across the shade structure there for the next generation of kids. How many know we, we gotta invest in the next generation, amen? This is gonna be a beautiful state of the art facility. When you leave today, you're gonna to get one of these magazines. It says Kingdom Impact and Vision. I think you'll be very amazed and overwhelmed at what God is doing through all the ministries of our church. Last year, through all our ministries combined, I think $46 million came in. And you can see all those dollars at work in all the different locations in this magazine. You can also see what's next for Dream City. In just three weeks, starting two new campuses on the Native American Reservation. Amen. Dream City Apache. So we're asking you all to jump on this train because we're going somewhere, folks. We're not sitting on our hands. We're not waiting things out. We're being aggressive with the gospel. So when you leave here today, there's a magazine, but you also get this this little card here, and um, it looked like this, and it's, it's already creased. So you can just fold it like this and put it on your dash of your car or put it on your dinner table. It's somewhere where you see it every single day. And this is all I'm asking you to do. We're not gonna put a lot of pressure on you. We're just asking you to pray. Anybody believe in prayer around here? Amen. Just pray and say, God, how would you have me be involved? Maybe God's asking you to go without Starbucks for the next nine months. I can't live. Well, you can, actually can. You, you, you can't you can live without it. And just by doing that, if it's a 
$20 habit a week, that's $80 a month. That's, you know, about a thousand bucks. You could be a part of something that's gonna outlive you. I was asking all of us to think about it and sacrifice in ways that can help us get this job done. I think we have about 4 million or 3 million raised from this campus. The project's gonna be about $11 million. So we have a ways to go. But wouldn't it be great if we could break ground later this year knowing that most of the money has come in, we're almost there, believing the rest of it will come in. Let's get this done for the glory of God. So I'm gonna pray. We've already had an invitation to receive the Lord here today. God has already moved in a mighty way. Let's never forget, friends, the reason why God wants to bless us. He wants to bless us to show us that he knows more than we know. He wants to bless us to show us how different he is in us. And he wants to bless you so that you could be a blessing. There's a lot of things in my life I've done wrong. There's one thing that I wish that you would all do just like I've done. And this came from my parents. And that's put God first in your finances. Because you will never regret that. I, I regret spending money on a lot of things in life. I've never regretted one penny I've ever given to God's work. Have you? Do you? Let's come next week. Let's commit. Let's give. And just make a nine-month commitment. Or it can be just one. Bring a check next week if you have it right now. We'll get started even earlier, okay? We love you all so much. I feel like my dad wants to say something today, but we are completely out of time. So I can't yield unless you want to hear from him today. Just talk right from there. They can see on the screen. And then pray for <laughs> Well, really, I was just sitting there enjoying it. Uh, I wasn't wanting to say anything, but I will say just this. And this is what should be said. You got to get out of the boat to see if you can walk on water. <laughs> so this morning... Begin to pray and get out of the boat. Let's get out of the boat. Let's make a commitment that those kids will have the greatest school, the greatest Sunday school opportunity. When they come, they'll run to that building. They'll want to be there. This is going to be a beautiful building. It's going to have all the things for kids to enjoy. Recreation, play, is going to kind of be the Disneyland? Well, we don't say that anymore. Amen. They're too woke for us. Amen. But it's going to be a wonderful place that the kids can have a big time, but hear the Word of God. And you know what? I really believe there are people in this building that could probably write the entire check. I don't know who you are, but I just believe that you're here. There are people who could write large checks. Wouldn't it be great when you said that a while ago? We could just begin to break ground this year. You know, we're kind of looking at maybe you're, boy, wouldn't it be great? So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that every one of us will just give and give great. We'll pray about it. And next Sunday, we'll come and make that nine-month commitment. As one of your pastors, God, I'm going to do it. I'm not asking him to do anything that we're not going to do. And we're going to do largely. And may we all give largely to the kingdom of God. And we'll come next week rejoicing in the goodness of God. So help us to go your way, rejoicing, praying, thanking God that we have a part of God's kingdom as kingdom builders in Jesus' name. And everybody said a big...